We have um, a great webinar today. I'm really excited to be uh, hosting this today. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. So again, I'll mention that we're gonna use the chat box to communicate with uh, other participants. So please go ahead and open that up. Make sure that you select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your response. My name is Elizabeth Noble. I'm the manager of donor engagement at Sierra Club BC, and I want to acknowledge that I'm currently working from our offices on beautiful Lekwungen territory in Victoria, BC. We will be recording this webinar today, so if you do want to share it with anyone or if you have to drop off early, you're welcome to uh, watch it later. Uh, just a point of note that we will be using the Q&A panel, so if you have questions that you want to ask the panelist, please make sure that you type them into the Q&A panel. And if you have thoughts that you wanna share with the other participants or you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and where you're joining us from today, please use the chat box. And it looks like we have a number of people who've joined us from Vancouver, Gabriola, West Vancouver, Charlottetown from Mi'kmaq territory, welcome. That's amazing. Uh, Qualicum Beach, wonderful. Excited to have so many of you here today. So uh, I will introduce our panelists. Uh, we have CR Club's Flossie Baker, Anjali Apaderai, and Tim Pearson. Uh, up first will be Anjali, who is a climate justice advocate, communicator, and consultant. She began her career in international climate politics, organizing social movements around the UN climate space. Anjali then returned home to BC to work on building a community-driven class action lawsuit against some of the biggest names in the fossil fuel industry. Today, Anjali works to strengthen climate change discourse in Canada by centering the stories of those on the front lines of the climate crisis. Anjali works with the Sierra Club BC team to support us in connecting climate change to socioeconomic and political realities and supports our role as a strong contributor to the Canadian and global climate justice movement. Welcome, Anjali. Up next is Flossie Baker, who is our climate justice organizer and has just accepted the newly created position of lead organizer at Sierra Club BC. Her passion is supporting different communities to engage in building a new story about the future we face. With a background in journalism and communications, Flossie is interested in how the narratives we, sh we shape or we create shape our imagination for action. She trained as a community organizer under the Industrial Areas Foundation, the oldest community organizing network in North America, and brings stories and lessons in organizing from the UK, the San Francisco Bay Area, Victoria, and Vancouver. She now focuses on building relationships with unions and faith traditions, and she's based in East Vancouver. Welcome, Flossie. Hi, thanks for having me. And next, we are joined by Sierra Club BC's Director of Operations and Communications, Tim Pearson. Tim grew up in the UK and fell in love with the outdoors on summer camping trips to the highlands of Scotland and skiing in the Alps during the winter. Arriving in BC as a teenager, Tim lived in Kitimat and Smithers, where he first awakened to environmental issues during the debate over Alcan's Kimano completion project and its potentially devastating effects on the Bulkley River. Tim attended UBC where he picked up an English degree and a passion for political debate and engagement. He's been at Sierra Club BC since April 2014. Hi Tim. Hi everybody and uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, working in the background to make sure that our technology is working, we have our communications specialist Maya Van Ludenberg. In addition to being our IT whiz, Maya is also a talented visual storyteller and graphic designer. Thanks for your help today, Maya. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Great, okay, so let's get started by making some connections between Sierra Club BC's involvement with the Just Recovery Movement and the anti-racism activism that is happening globally right now. Anjali, can you talk a little bit about why the environmental movement needs to address racism? Yes, thank you, Elizabeth, um, for introducing us. And hello, everybody, so glad to be here and, and uh, so glad to see so many of you here. I'm just gonna share some slides with you uh, just to begin um, digging into this concept of why the environmental movement needs necessarily needs to be anti-racist. So, um, so one second, I'll just share my screen with you. All right. Um, can you just type in the box if you can see this? 
Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, all right. So the last few weeks have been overwhelming. I mean, the last few months have been overwhelming and we're finding ourselves not just in a global pandemic, but actually in a confluence of several intersecting crises. Uh, there's protests um, in, in the United States and in Canada here where racial tensions have reached a boiling point. The coronavirus is still continuing to rage through the world and take so many lives. Um, climate crisis is still looming and somehow, even though everyone's still at home, emissions are still going up and we're still set to miss our climate targets, targets that were already weak to begin with. And on top of that, we're losing more old growth in BC, um, these irreplaceable uh, beings that, that we're fighting so hard to preserve. Um, and it can feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, these are all the things that have sort of captured our minds and hearts in the past few weeks, on top of other things as well. And to me, I see these things as deeply interconnected. Um, I see all of these crises as intersecting and I see them all as symptoms of the same thing. They're symptoms of a broken system that's no longer working for us or for the planet. They're symptoms of capitalism that is sagging at the seams, um, where it's not serving communities of color, particularly black and indigenous peoples. It's not serving the climate. It's not serving our health. It's not serving our well-being and it's not serving our wild spaces and our ecosystems. And so this is kind of the entry point as to this connection between racism and the environmental movement that I wanted to begin with. So Sierra Club BC has um, stood in solidarity uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement because we recognize that the struggle against racial injustice is so deeply connected to our work because you cannot have ecosystem health or you cannot have human health without ecosystem health. And you cannot fight for the environment without recognizing that there's a deep racial um, element to that. What you, not all environmental policies are good for everyone. And we have often approached environmentalism from, um, from a, a conservation legacy that has deeply undermined the rights of indigenous peoples um, across Turtle Island. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm actually going to pass it over to Flossy, I think, or back to you, Elizabeth, because I think that's the end of this first section. More on this later. <laughs> go ahead, Flossy. Flossy. Well, I'd, I'll just go in a bit deeper about um, the links between racism and environmentalism. And could you just click on the next slide, please? Yeah, so I want to... Um, just read a few paragraphs from this news story. The headline is, I'm a black climate expert. Racism derails our efforts to save the planet. And it's written by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. And her words are so good, I'm just gonna share them here. She writes, here is an incomplete list of things I left unfinished because of America's racism and militarization. A policy memo to members of Congress on accelerating offshore wind energy development in US waters. The introduction to my book on climate solutions. A presentation for a powerful corporation on how technology can advance ocean climate solutions. A grant proposal to fund a network of women climate leaders. A fact check of a big budget film script about ocean climate themes. And planting vegetables with my mother in our climate victory garden. Toni Morrison said it best in a 1975 speech. The very fu serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. As a marine biologist and policy nerd, building community around climate solutions is my life's work. But I'm also a black person in the United States. I work on one existential crisis, that these days I can't concentrate because of another. Can you do the next slide, Ange? And obviously these inequalities are compounded in the time of COVID. This morning I woke up to the news that black frontline doctors are joining the protests in the US with signs that read, don't kill my patients. 
And whilst these are examples from the US, they could also easily be examples uh, in Canada. In the last few weeks alone, there's been um, one black and one indigenous, um, two women, one black and one indigenous shot by the police in Toronto and New Brunswick. And so if we want to find climate solutions, then we have to take anti-racism really, really seriously. We can't have one without working on the other. And do you want to pick up a bit more about environmental racism? Sure. <clears throat> I wanted to put these two um, photos up and just to, to say their names, George Floyd and Regis Korczynski Paquette, as, um, as Flossie just mentioned, two um, recent deaths um, by the hand of the police that have sparked so much controversy recently, but they are only two of many. Um, and I highlight this because I think it's so important to honor them as, as people whose lives were taken unjustly and who were able to, uh, who were able to spark um, a movement that has thus far become the largest civil rights movement in history, actually, with all 50 states and 18 countries participating in the past few weeks, which is a huge win. And also just to highlight that it's not a problem that's unique to the U.S. Uh, Regis is Canadian. And for example, in Toronto, um, Black people only make up 9% nine per nine of the population, yet they are 20 times more likely to be shot. Um, and across Canada as a whole, Indigenous people only make up 5% of the population, but they make up 26% of um, incarcerated peoples. And so those are huge disparities and it, it really speaks to our need that we can't serve communities without recognizing the deep inequities within communities. And I want, um, Elizabeth, did you have anything before I go into the next piece or? No, you go right ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up some more, this is a bit more of a data data driven approach to demonstrating this concept of environmental injustice and it being related to our work as an environmental advocacy organization and a science-based organization. Um, the term environmental racism has picked up a lot of traction and a lot of scholarship in the past few years because it's the best term to, uh, to describe the way that communities of color disproportionately face the negative impacts of industrial activity and they're exposed to more environmental pollutants and toxic waste than white communities. Um, so environmental racism is a concept derived from the fact that indigenous peoples and marginalized or poor communities of color are disproportionately impacted by toxic environmental practices. So waste runoff, um, tailings ponds, um, any sort of toxic waste from industrial activity. And it's a seen by many as a sort of new face of colonialism and historic discrimination in Canada because um, a lot of these toxic projects are placed in proximity to Indigenous and Black communities. For example, mercury contamination at Grassy Narrows, which became a huge movement, um, but, but still wasn't solved for the community. Ongoing pollution from the Mount Polly mining disaster, the looming threat of the Site C dam construction and the, the many indigenous lands that that's going to pollute and contaminate. Um, Amnesty International has been pushing for environmental racism to be recognized um, by the government as a deep part of reconciliation and, and a deep part of um, serving the health and well-being of indigenous peoples. So this project is called Enrich and it's a it's an academic project that's based in Nova Scotia but this trend actually tends to hold across Canada and essentially they mapped Nova Scotia out um, and the the red circles with the W's or T's or O's are uh, either waste um, waste uh, plants or uh, toxic, um, basically toxic ponds or basically toxic sites that are that are released into the environment from industrial activity. Um, and the blue and green dots are indigenous and African Canadian communities. And this is just one piece of the data. I could only screenshot a little bit, but you can go and, 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 and dive into this project a bit more at that website. 
Um, but it just shows that these communities are more exposed. They're closer to the toxic sites. Um, and they are feeling the health impacts of, of, um, of those pollutants disproportionately. They tend to be, uh, especially in the top right hand corner, you can see that they're clustered very closely together. And of course, the best known example of environmental racism in Canada is the tar sands. Uh, the uh, Fort Chippewa Nation, the Labuquen Cree people, or not the Labuquen Cree people, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Cree people, Labuquen Cree is my friend Melina. Um, they are exposed to poison, essentially, from the tar sands. And not just the health of their communities, but the health of everything that they're connected to, whether it be the animals that they hunt, the animals that they trap, or the fish that they are consuming, or the plants that they're consuming from their lands, everything is affected um, by this highly concentrated site of, of poisonous industrial activity. And of course, it re-entrenches the centuries of colonialism that Indigenous peoples have already faced and places a huge burden on the health of their communities. So, I should probably, uh, you can feel free to check out Enrich and, um, and we'll have more resources, resources on this for you um, as time goes. Thanks Anjali, I really appreciate you going over all that and um, it's especially important for those of us who live in uh, Victoria and Vancouver and have clean drinking water and such a high standard of living to realize that this is happening here in BC and across Canada. So let's go next to uh, Tim Pearson, who's been with Sierra Club BC for nearly six years. Tim, for many of our supporters, this kind of approach may seem pretty radical in terms of a departure from our conventional science-based advocacy and environmental protection. Can you speak to this concern that we might be losing something when as an environmental movement, we already feel stretched so thin? Yeah, I think it's a good question, and I think it's a legitimate concern for people to have. Um, but uh, it's very much the case that science remains absolutely at the core of what we do at Sierra Club BC. It hasn't been abandoned at all, and I'm sure many of the people who are joining us today have seen or listened to somebody like Jens uh, Vieting um, in our uh, campaigns department who is our science advisor and very much within the organization sort of hammers home those themes and the importance of those things. But I think what we need to realize is that science alone isn't enough. Um, the science tells us kind of what we need to do, um, but science doesn't give us the power to actually make the things that need to happen happen. And you know, for all the efforts of the environmental community over the years, um, all the efforts of Sierra Club, um, and you know, we're over 50 years old now and we've had some tremendous victories over the years in our work, but quite frankly, we're losing. Um, you know, the climate crisis is getting worse. The ecological degradation we're seeing is getting worse. These things are not getting better. And I think one of the reasons why they're not getting better is we simply don't have enough power. And because whether you're talking about politicians or corporations or whomever we need to, uh, to move to get change to happen, we need power to do that, right? And I think we don't have power because we don't have a broad enough coalition of people who are supporting us. And I'm not talking just about Sierra Club, I'm talking about the environmental movement as a whole. And we really need power at the scale of the challenges we're facing. And climate change obviously is the biggest crisis of all. Uh, it dwarfs COVID, it dwarfs uh, race issues. Um, it is the true existential threat that we, uh, we have to deal with. Um, so, we need to bring in more people from more varied backgrounds um, to build that coalition. And I think one way of looking at it is, you know, I read an article the other day that had this statement that really hit me hard. And it said, basically, you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones. And you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people. And you can't have disposable people without racism. So what Anjali was just talking about where, you know, corporations and governments are able to place waste sites and polluting industries, 
next to communities of color and indigenous communities. That is because of the existence of racism and that these people are seen as disposal, disposable, excuse me, in relation to the rest of the population. So working backwards from that, if we can eliminate racism, then we get rid of the concept of disposable people. If we get rid of the con concept of disposable people, how can you have sacrifice zones? And then we have everybody working together with a common interest that this earth, these life support systems that sustain us, we all need them. Whatever our background, wherever we live, whatever the color of our skin, the God we worship or whatever. And that is essential to the fight. It brings more people in, it makes sure that we don't have disposable people and it will broaden that coalition and build us the power that we can reverse this terrible crisis of climate change, reverse the terrible ecological collapse we're seeing all over the planet. And in the end, all have a better quality of life, not just humans, but all living beings on this planet. Thanks, Tim. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's really helpful. And, and, um, and I just also want to reassure, you know, our supporters that the science work is continuing. This is about adding. This is not about taking away. You know, we can't be effective policymakers if we don't have Jens doing this important research to be able to back up. You know, the data is still important and it's still work that we're going to be doing. But this is just um, an addition to help build the kind of power that, um, that we need to actually win. So let's uh, get right into the veggie based meat of this discussion today, which is the just recovery principles. So Anjali, why don't you um, uh, elaborate more specifically on that? Sure. Thank you so much, Tim, for um, not only laying out what's wrong, but the reverse, what could be better. I really appreciate that. I tend to, I tend to get down when I think about these things. Um, in the negative too much. All right, so all of that being said, we have worked really hard to find in the context of COVID and this pandemic and the way things are gonna be changing going forward um, and how, and, and, and given the fact that there's gonna be a recovery plan and there's gonna be some very uh, stark decisions made about how to rebuild the economy. Um, We've worked very hard um, along with 400 other organizations from across Canada to come up with a blueprint, a framework for how to do our work going forward that incorporates what Elizabeth and Tim were just talking about, our role as an environmental advocacy and science-based organization, as well as the need to protect communities and um, add that to our, our environmental analysis. And with these other groups from very diverse sectors across Canada. I have to say, I've done a lot of coalition work and this was one of the most diverse coalitions I've ever worked in. These organizations represent every sector. They're arts-based, there's migrant justice, there's race, there's environment, there's climate, there's, um, oh my gosh, just name it, uh, every civil society, progressive civil society sector is, um, reflected in this coalition and we worked for a couple months and we came up with six principles to guide any recovery plan in Canada and they're called the Just Recovery Principles and you can read more about them at justrecoveryforall.ca um, and I thought I would just uh, work through these principles with you because um, they are going to be guiding our work for the next bit and um, and I hope you'll see I hope you'll see why we're really excited about them. So principle number one is put people's health and well-being first, no exceptions. And I think that this is really the umbrella principle for this whole framework of just recovery. What COVID has made us realize is that this is all, all of this is about health, health on every level, on the individual level, family level, and the community level, and the ecosystem level, and of course the global level. We cannot thrive and we cannot do our work and we can't do anything that we care about without our health. And um, so this first principle is about 
any policy or program that is put in place going forward from COVID must address the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. And um, they must be responsive to the climate emergency, which in itself is a health crisis. Of course, the climate crisis is the greatest health um, challenge of all. We have to learn from the pandemic and develop policies and invest in things that keep our communities healthy, our workplaces healthy, and especially those on the front lines safe. And so this principle is, is, that, is, the, is the bottom line. Nothing can function without health. And the recovery plan needs to reflect that. Principle two is to strengthen the social safety net and provide relief directly to the people. Another thing that we've seen from the uh, from COVID is that we are nothing without uh, our strong communities, and life is much much more difficult when you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from, and when there's no social safety net to support you when things get really hard. Add any kind of vulnerability to that equation, whether it's health conditions, whether it's poverty or any other socioeconomic condition, and that becomes a lot more difficult. And so principle number two is about focusing relief efforts directly on people, particularly those who are structurally oppressed by the, by the current system, indigenous peoples and poor communities in, in, in particular. So re redistributive policies are so important for this. Social services are so important for this. Um, services that meet the immediate and long-term needs of people and strive to eliminate those social and economic and wealth inequalities that have made the pandemic so much worse for certain people. Um, this principle actually includes some really key input from migrant justice groups who have pointed out correctly that um, immigrants and uh, migrants and temporary foreign workers and those without reliable status in this country face some of the greatest challenges during this pandemic because there isn't a reliable way to um, to get basic health care, to have their health needs taken care of and to, to, to have any certainty about their future. And so part of this principle is calling for um, a single tier immigration system with permanent residence status for all. That is very important to me being a former permanent resident. Principle three is to prioritize the needs of workers and communities. Um, as we saw in this pandemic, it was the frontline workers, it was the essential workers that upheld all of us in a time of great crisis and in a time of great need. And I think there's been a real collective um, agreement and recognition that these people need to be uplifted more. So um, princip this principle calls for support to be distributed in a manner consistent with indigenous sovereignty, a climate resilient economy and worker rights, which includes safe and fair labor standards and, and a right to unionize. Improved conditions for essential service workers must be maintained beyond this crisis. And so basically this is talking about when choosing where to give support, the government must prioritize workers and communities and not give handouts or bailouts to the fossil fuel industry, not give bailouts to industries that were proven to be more of a burden during this pandemic than a real help. Um, and so these, pro these um, relief programs that going forward absolutely need to support a just transition away from fossil fuels and to create decent jobs and decent work for all um, because we've shown that that's that's really what people care about at the end of the day supporting their families and their communities all right principle four uh build resilience to prevent future crises and this is where sierra club was really able to offer our analysis very strongly because this principle is about the fact that we cannot recover from this current crisis and we cannot be prepared for future crises by entrenching the same systems that will cause the next crisis. Um, we really view COVID as part, as I said earlier, as, as part of these intersecting and overlapping crises that are stemming back to the same unequal economic system. Um, the people who are harmed most in this pandemic are the same people that we need to protect going forward. 
And so this principle recognizes that there's no human health without ecosystem health and that our environmental protection work is critical to building resilience for communities and for people um, to, to, to prevent future crises. So part of this principle is calling for um, investing in sustainable infrastructure um, and investing in low carbon infrastructure, um, ensuring that people can access public essential services so that our communities are stronger, that people are well taken care of and that we're not left high and dry when the next crisis rolls around. It's about meeting people's basic needs and recognizing on top of that our interdependence with the environment. Um, I love that the illustration is showing uh, people gardening because to, to me that's, you know, that's been one big thing that's come out of this pandemic. Everybody's wanting to grow their own food, which is a huge positive step in the right direction. Triple five is to build solidarity and equity across, across communities, generations, and borders. So what does this mean? It means that we live in a globalized world and it, we have to extend our advocacy and our care beyond our own communities, even though we can't function unless our communities are healthy and unless our surrounding environment is healthy, we do need to extend solidarity and practice solidarity um, across the borders that divide us. So in this world, we say, uh, one way of saying it is, my liberation is tied up in yours, or what happens to one of us happens to all of us. Um, and that's all the more true in a world in which our actions affect each other. So a just recovery must be guided by principles of equity, solidarity, and sustainability um, across Canada, across Turtle Island, and across the world. So recovery plans must honor and expand human rights, including and especially the rights of Indigenous people, and advance gender equity while opposing authoritarian regimes and oppressive systems. And what we see in times of crisis uh, and we definitely saw during this pandemic is that when there's a time of upheaval and a time of uncertainty, um, authoritarian powers, um, corporate powers will work during that time to re-entrench um, uh, exploitative power relations. And we want to avoid that. And so part of this principle and part of the just recovery framework in general is reasserting what we believe to be important um, and not allowing for that to happen. And finally, but not least in any way, shape or form, is to uphold Indigenous rights and work in partnership with Indigenous peoples. To me, this, this should have been earlier in the list of principles because this is a principle that cross cuts all of them. You can't do any of this work. We can't do our environmental protection work. You can't do any justice work without working deeply and taking leadership from Indigenous peoples because those are the peoples who stewarded this land for thousands of years before we took it over. Um, and, and, and who are systematically marginalized by the current system. And so indigenous peoples require sustained resources and investment to stimulate indigenous economies, to maintain and create healthy indigenous communities and to protect the lands and waters that have been stewarded by indigenous peoples across this land. Um, so that includes an investment in infrastructure and social and health services. And, this definitely includes respecting ind indigenous jurisdiction rights and, um, and uh, land ownership during this time. So what was happening right before the pandemic on Wet'suwet'en territory is something that we want to avoid and not allow to happen in, in the wake of this pandemic and beyond. So those were the six just recovery principles and um, we, we will be unrolling more work on these. Uh, a lot of our campaigns are going to work in tandem with these principles. And um, uh, it's, been, it's been a long road to develop them, but I think we've done a great job. And I really consider this to be the counter effort to the shock doctrine politics that are happening during this time. Uh, I consider this to be a counter effort to the fossil fuel industry wanting increased investment and bailout so that they can continue to entrench business as usual after this. So we have to uphold and strengthen these principles. And um, I guess the last thing I'll say on it is that they don't actually mean anything. They're just words on a page unless people take them and make them their own. And so that's why the principles are unbranded and they don't belong to anyone. They belong to all of us. 
Um, so you're encouraged to go to the website, download the graphics, share them, make your own uh, mix and, and add to and make your own materials. Use them in any way that you see fit. And I think Flossie will say more on that. Um, can you, no, thanks. Um, yeah, well, I'll just close by speaking briefly about how these principles are going to inform Sierra Club's work going forward. First and foremost, as Anne said, they will be like this additional lens through which all our future campaigns will be viewed through. We know that if we are going to act on a scale on the scale that the science requires of us, then we have to build more power. And to build that power, there's no other way around it than to be in relationships with people outside of the mainstream environmental movement. And these six principles remind us to continually be um, building those relationships with other groups, whether that's faith communities or labor communities or, or dance clubs or refugee welcome groups. These six principles hold us accountable to make sure that we don't lose sight of that relationship and power building. And I'll just, I'll just kind of echo again what Ange said about making these personal. We don't want these six principles to kind of be viewed as this wishy-washy abstract thing that only policymakers think about. Um, we really want you to Think about what they mean in your life and in your community. Think of them maybe as like a pair of glasses that you put on in the morning, a new lens that allows you to look at the world differently that day. Um, maybe or maybe putting the just recovery glasses on will will help um, the world look a little bit brighter and a bit more interconnected than it did before. And I guess that's the note that I want to end this on. I want to just uh, pop in here and add one additional thing, which is that um, we are also getting into the nitty gritty like this, you know, we've introduced here these just recovery principles, but uh, for example, Sierra Club BC is a member of uh, Greater Victoria Acting Together. Uh, Greater Victoria Acting Together is a coalition of diverse groups labor unions, faith groups, frontline service organizations. Um, and we have been invited to submit policy proposals that are in line with the just recovery. And so that work is actually being done by many groups, you know, who are already, um, you know, working deeply on these issues. And so I don't want anyone out there to think that we're just talking entirely aspirational. This is just the framework that all of these policies are going to be based on. And that work is happening and it's happening all across the sectors. And we also invite you to be part of it. It's not going to work if it's just, you know, Sierra Club coming to the table with our, you know, message. We really do need um, you as Sierra Club supporters to also adopt this and go out and um, and help. You know, we, we really do need everyone on side. Um, so Anjali, can you talk a little bit more specifically about how they can do that? Yes. So there are many ways, several ways, to take action on the Just Recovery Principles right now. And as I mentioned, we'll be rolling out more in the coming weeks and months. But for now, uh, one thing you can do to endorse the principles is, so right now the principles are a, um, you can endorse them um, if you have an organization. They're not open for individual endorsements right now, but rather in bar, um, organizational endorsements. So if you're a member of an organization, a club, a grassroots group, any type of group that has a name, um, you, can, you can endorse the principles and there's a form on the website. So the website is justrecoveryforall.ca. And um, there's, there's a clear button on there that says endorse. And you can, I, I think we're up to almost 3,000 endorsers now. So that's really positive. Second, we have uh, a Just Recovery action page on our website. Um, I think Maria is going to link to that. Um, and on that, there she goes. Yeah. And then on the action page, you can find... Um, several ways to take action. First, um, we have an action where you can send a letter to um, Premier Horgan 
calling for a just recovery, outlining these principles and underscoring why they're so important for him to endorse and support going forward. Um, you can support our old growth work on that page because as, as we talked about, it's deeply linked to this work. Um, and stay tuned because uh, there'll be more campaigns being rolled out uh, using the Just Recovery lens. Going forward, we'll also be offering training for volunteers and members who want to get involved with our relational organizing campaign, which I'm really excited to be working on, uh, along with Flossie uh, leading it off, um, because we know that we need to build power to counter these powerful forces um, and as an adequate response to climate change and we build power through organizing our communities and our friends and um, ourselves so we invite you to join us for the training sessions that will be coming up and they'll be largely based online so you can join from anywhere um, furthermore if you identify as a member of another community for example a faith group an artist collective a labor union a community center or even just a group of friends I invite you to consider how you might be able to help mobilize your group to take some kind of collective action. And um, this can really take many forms and it's up to your own imagination, but I just want to let you know that we at Sierra Club BC, especially myself and Flossie, are here and available to help you organize if you're inspired, if you have an idea, and if you have a group to work with. Um, and we'll help you organize within your own community. So it doesn't mean we're asking you to plan a rally, it just means if you have an idea for any type of way to organize your community, you could do a teach-in like this. Um, you could do a training of some sort. You could just have a, a, a discussion over cake. I don't know. It's, it's really up to your imagination. So I really invite you to get in touch with us. Uh, you can send Elizabeth an email at gifts at sierraclub.bc.ca if, you, if you'd like to learn more about that. Anjali, I have a question. Like we mentioned a lot of community groups, but like would a small business be able to endorse the Just Recovery Principles? Great question. Yeah. So it's being framed as a progressive civil society. And I asked the same question myself because there wasn't a lot of business as part of the coalition, but progressive businesses are absolutely welcome to endorse. Um, and I do think that small business, family owned business, progressive businesses are such a deeply important part of community as an, and a huge part of the solution as well. So uh, please feel free if you have a business that would like to endorse, go ahead and do that. Amazing, thank you so much. Okay, we're doing really well for time. I'm so grateful that everyone's <laughs> uh, helped me uh, keep things on uh, schedule. So we have a number of questions that are already in the Q&A panel. I'll actually tackle the first one from Paul, who is asking about the Northern Pulp in um, Mill in Picto, Nova Scotia, uh, ASEC in Boat Harbor that's been operating for 50 years. It's so funny that you brought that up, Paul, because when I saw Anjali's slide just before we were, um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, what we were going to present today, I recalled the time that I went to the Picto Lobster Festival. And for the first few days, you know, it was just lovely to be there. And on the third day, the wind changed and just the, the you know, smoke or whatever it was that was in the air was so thick that when I blinked, my eyelids stuck together. The pollution was that strong. And, you know, this is a classic example of what Anjali was talking about with the environmental racism and the fact that that was chosen to be there for so long. Obviously, because it's in Nova Scotia, Sierra Club BC doesn't have an official position. We're, we're not taking that campaign on per se, but uh, it's long overdue for that uh, to be closing and, and for those people that have lived there for so long to not be suffering from that anymore. Um, and then the next question is also about, would it not be more powerful if all the like-minded organizations came together to increase our impact? And I think that's exactly what we're talking about. Flossie, do you wanna address that a little bit more about what we've started to do? Yeah, Sierra Club is already a member of two very diverse community alliances, one in Victoria, one in Vancouver. We're the only environmental nonprofit in both of those organizations. Um, and we were taking real leadership in both of them. And over the coming months, we're going to try and figure out how we can be in more diverse relationships with civil society, civil society organizations in other parts of the province too, but stay tuned for that. Thank you. 
We have another question from an anonymous attendee. How are you going to get corporations on side? Flossie, I actually want you to address that and maybe talk a little bit about um, the balance of power structure that you've shown me before. Is that possible? We talk about the sphere of influence in, in society and, and how that is currently structured in the, about power building. Could you just rephrase the question? Yeah, sure. So the question is, you know, how do you get corporations on side? And when you've talked to me about relational organizing, you've sort of mapped out the different spheres of influence in the way that our society is structured with, um, you know, corporations and governments and civil society. And maybe you can speak to how our relational organizing is designed to address getting corporations on side, basically. Okay, well, yeah, normally when I talk about this, I have a piece of paper and I draw three circles and I draw a huge circle to represent the market or corporate sector, a tiny little circle to represent the government. And then actually the third circle is more like this kind of exploding firework. And that's meant to um, represent civil society. And the idea behind that very, very overly basic diagram is that the power of the corporate sphere is so huge that it's really had a detrimental effect on the civil sector and the civil sector is us it's nonprofits, it's faith groups it's unions and the effect that it has had on us is has really been to splinter us off from each other to put us into silos to get us into this continual mindset that we have to compete for resources and energy and even issues um, and when we're stuck in that mindset, it can be very, very hard for us to find the kind of energy and vision to figure out how to come together. And yet that is exactly what we have to do. We have to try and move from being this kind of scattered firework of different organizations in the civil sector to being a way more unified circle. And it's only if we can become a more unified circle will we be able to hold the power of the, uh, the corporate sphere to, to greater account. Thank you. It was really helpful. Uh, Michael is asking if we can provide a short list of actions for our local municipal governments to take. Uh, perhaps we have a counselor contact from each city, uh, make a referral motion to staff to respond to how we are incorporating these principles for a just recovery. It's an excellent idea. Um, I don't know if we have any of that resource, uh, those resources available. I know that it's something that Greater Victoria Acting Together has been um, working on at the sort of provincial and, and federal level. Do you know of any um, municipal actions that we might be able to help uh, our members with, or is that something we might need to put together? That's something that's in the works. Um, the principles are very new. They were just launched on May 25th. And um, so every organization is sort of um, doing their own thing with them. So I don't think anyone has taken on a municipal action yet, but I think even as a start, getting them, getting the principles in front of them and, um, this is really a community imagination thing. You take the principles, you look at them, and you think about something in your community that um, the principles could be applied to, that you could push for as a policy. It's a good way to get the six principles in front of your city council as a delegate. Um, but yeah, that's something we'll continue to work on. Thanks, Anjali. Um, Megan is asking, it seems to me, part of this movement of movements will require groups like Sierra Club BC to give up their charitable status so that you're not forced to continue seeming to be nonpartisan politically. Uh, connecting with the Green Party provincially, federally seems like a basic tool since other parties are really talking about continuing the status quo. Uh, for example, Premier Horgan is saying BC citizens need to go out and buy, buy, buy as soon as things open up. Can you speak to that? Tim, do you want to talk a bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that we have to recognize a couple of realities. One is that um, as a charitable nonprofit, a lot of our revenue depends upon that status. Like 
a lot of foundations won't give to non-charitable organizations. And so it would be a huge shift for us and we would figure out, have to figure out how to uh, make that shift financially, right? And that would have to be over probably a considerable length of time to be able to do that in practical terms. Secondly, I think that, that we can still work with political parties and governments in a nonpartisan way that's effective in terms of talking about what policies uh, need to be implemented and whatnot. And I don't think that, um, my own personal view is, I don't think that our charitable status limits us in terms of being able to build the type of power that we were talking about earlier through these principles, through adding the lens of just recovery to our work. Um, we're still trying to do the same things. We're just uh, trying to do them in a different way. Um, so I think it's a twofold answer. One, in practical terms, it would be quite challenging. And the second is, I, I think we're still, we're, we're not too limited in what we can do. Um, and there are lots of implications in actually shifting into a more partisan model, right? Because then do you end up alienating a whole bunch of people who don't share that same partisan view, right? If we want a broad coalition of common interests, to, at a certain level, it has to cut across party and partisan lines, as well as demographic lines and racial lines and so on and so forth. I hope that's, uh, that's a helpful answer. Thanks, Jim. So I have a couple of other questions here um, that uh, are not in the, the box, but I, one of the questions that came in was that we, there was not a ton of direct language about the environment in the Just Recovery Principles. And Anjali, can you maybe talk a little bit about where those principles are overlapping directly with um, the goals of environmental protection and climate change? Um, you mean where the Just Recovery Principles are specifically addressing environment? Yeah, which principles are the ones that you know we might want to be focusing our attention on? Yeah. Um, so. I would say they all, again, they all have those interconnections, but specifically where there's wording about environmental uh, either protection or interdependence with the environment um, is principle one. So if you go to the website, justrecoveryforall.ca, there's a bit more explanation about each principle. And I read some of that out loud, um, but uh, the, yeah, each principle is fleshed out. So in principle one, it recognizes explicitly that human health is interdependent interdependent, excuse me, with environmental health uh, or ecosystem health. And in principle four is the other one where we talk about building resilient communities and how protecting the environment is a key part of building resilience and preventing future crises because there's no human health without ecosystem health. So those right. are the two specific ones, but you can, I mean, principle six around environment, uh, indigenous jurisdiction and leadership really, really touches on a lot of our work as well. Yeah, I don't know the exact stat, but I think it's something like, you know, indigenous people are, you know, a very small percentage of the world's population, yet they are the stewards of over 80% of the di biodiversity in the, in the world. So um, definitely that's a, a direct correlation there. Um, Flossie, I'm wondering if you would have time to sort of recount your conversation that you had uh, with some of the relational organizing work that you did in the North Island, where you didn't necessarily go and, you know, directly have a conversation about um, our forests campaign, but um, it ended up dovetailing a little bit. Could you speak to that? Sure. Um, I think I know what you mean, but for Jump and Elizabeth, if I'm answering not in a way that's helpful. Uh, <laughs> I, um, as part of Sierra Club's All Growth Forest campaign, I've been trying to build relationships with leaders of civil society organizations who are not necessarily part of the environmental movement in parts of rural Vancouver Island. And I had this one phone call um, with a priest in, in Port Alberni. And I, I made a point of, of not talking about forests at all for our entire phone call. I just called her up and said, 
I'm, I'm really interested in you as, as a leader of, an, of this church and, and how you're faring during this time of, of COVID and what that's like for you and what, how, how your members are feeling. And um, we talked and talked and talked. And then I said, well, can you tell me what's keeping you awake at night? And she said that she was worried about um, the health of her watershed. And I said, oh, can you tell me more? And then she talked for like 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, about how there was so much logging of old growth forest near her home that it was contaminating her watersheds. And I was just really struck by that conversation because I didn't have to mention old growth forests once. I just went to her to take a real interest in what her and her community were feeling and let her tell me what was important. And so she, she told me, she basically answered that question by being like, health, we're worried about our health. And, and, and it's, that's really important information for Sierra Club to hear. And it's now our job to figure out how we can listen for that kind of an answer better and then translate it into campaigns. Thank you. I think that's a really helpful illustration of how we're trying to build these relationships and what the just recovery principles will mean in terms of having lateral relationships um, across society, working towards uh, areas of common interest so that we can address all of these crises uh, simultaneously. Um, we have another question here from Pat Carl, who says, I've heard a lot of talk about key infrastructure build and uh, rebuild um, and how that has to play into any just recovery. And Anjali mentioned that here. Um, and her worry is that those jobs are typically ones taken by men who have specific skill sets. And what about women? In 2008, men were really impacted by the Great Recession. It's acknowledged that uh, women have been more negatively impacted by this pandemic. Um, can you list some of what the just recovery principles can be focused on assisting women, First Nations women, women of color, et cetera? This is a great question. And I, I think it's a great thing to point out that um, environmental injustice and environmental racism is also very gendered. Um, and our, uh, our work needs to recognize that and does recognize that. Um, when we talk about a just transition away from fossil fuel industry to a low carbon economy, we're talking about, um, there's a number of different ways it could play out, but what we're really seeing is deep investment in retraining programs to, to um, train people into decent, well-paying and clean jobs in low carbon technology. Right now, the fossil fuel industry jobs are, um, the vast majority of them are um, male dominated jobs. And so those retraining programs would necessarily target the men who are in those um, oil and gas jobs right now. But I think it's really important to know that there is a space for everybody in the just transition and there needs to be in the just recovery as well. So I don't, while there's no specific campaign that I know of right now that is targeting the gendered aspect of this, I know that it's a critical piece of the just transition. Uh, women are, are a huge piece of this, whether it's in the science or technology sector. Um, I, I don't have an answer, except that, that we will have to continue um, creating and supporting the campaigns that are specifically about supporting women economically and otherwise during the, during the just transition. But I think when we advocate for decent work for all, um, I think that I think that's a key piece of it. Thanks. Yeah, it's an excellent point. So we've come to the end of our time today. I want to thank all of our panelists for their time and Maya for her technical assistance. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. This was a, a really interesting discussion and um, I hope you feel inspired and um, I hope that you'll continue to support our work. Uh, we are always offering these webinars for free and uh, we do rely on the generosity of individuals to make donations. So if you are not already a supporter, I invite you to make a donation today. All gifts are tax deductible and uh, I encourage you to sign up for a monthly gift if you haven't already. You can do that at sierraclub.bc.ca and please do go to our website sierraclub.bc.ca slash just recovery and 
take the action. It's such an easy, simple step. We've got it set up for you. You just put in your name and your postal code, and it's going to send a letter directly to your MLA and to the uh, Premier Horgan and uh, a couple of other people. It takes two seconds. Please do it. It's just one tiny step and uh and then you can do more you can go to the just recovery for all.ca and um i hope that you're inspired to to take some of this on personally and i'm happy to help as well so if you want to get in touch please feel free my email is gifts that's plural g-i-f-t-s at sierraclub.bc.ca thank you so much everybody thanks everyone thank so you everybody. everybody bye now bye, bye.